So today I'm going to talk, well, you know, as the title says, um, a little bit mostly about topology. Um, some of the most, I'm going to concentrate on the connections with optimization. And the applications that I will be considering are mostly going to be geometric, hence the shapes. Uh, so in principle, I'm, I'm not really not assuming any kind of prerequisite knowledge in topology. Uh, we're not really going to focus on the mathematical underpinnings of these things. Uh, but rather, I'm just going to kind of give the idea and show you uh, basically a, a very simple idea how it can have multiple applications. And I think uh, we're really just scratching the surface of what's possible. And, and I kind of hope to give you a flavor of this uh, you know, in the next 15 minutes or so. Okay, so uh, there's this joint work with a lot of different people. Uh, it's been going on kind of for the last few years. Um, it's probably going to continue for a while longer. Uh, most of the coding um, and kind of experiments have been run by the students, um, and they've really done kind of a remarkable job. And not only that, but they understand how a lot of these things work at a fundamental level in a way that I can. So if you have some very, very technical questions about how these things work, uh, I'll probably refer you to the right person, because I probably don't know the answer. OK. So starting off with uh, topology, I wanted to kind of start off at a very high level and just say you know, topology really is the study of spaces. And um, you know, if you ask a topologist or now you know some mathematician, they'll say, well, look at manifolds. We'll study a dynamical system, uh, maybe systems of polynomials. So what you get then is a variety. Uh, but you know, some sort of weird space that we've come up with, and we're going to study it. And you know, we're going to call it, say that the study of this thing is really topology. Okay, but um, kind of from my perspective, uh, what we're ultimately doing in all these different shapes and forms is, well, we don't necessarily just, I don't for now care about where my space is coming from. I want some sort of description of the space, OK? And the key idea is that the space or sequence of spaces, as it will be, is, is much too complicated for me to really understand. So I'm just going to distill it into some small descriptor, usually a number or something like this. And then I'm going to be able to say that if I have two things and I'm going to compare them, well, if the number is different, then I know somehow these things are different. Um, and then you know, going there, hopefully the number that I compute has some sort of relevance to, or to the shape that I can actually interpret. OK, so again, kind of I've started out saying something very, very general, but now kind of being things a little more specific. Uh, I'm primarily going to be talking about homology. I'm not going to introduce the formal definition, because if you know it, right, if not, it's not particularly important for this talk. Uh, the way that we're going to talk about it here is basically just a sequence of numbers. And it's going to be the number of components, the number of holes, the number of voids, and, and so forth, right? So for example, so these numbers are called Betty numbers. Um, if you know what homology is, it's the rank of homology. But um, e essentially, if I have a plot, all I have, or, or rather, if I have a point, all I have is one component, right? That's all that's really there. So I only have one number, a 0, right, which is the zero-dimensional numbers, which is the first. We start numbering with 0. And this is 1. A circle has one component and one hole. So we have two of these numbers that are 1. A sphere has three of these numbers, but it's 1, 0, 1, right? because there's no holes in it. It's just the space that's enclosed. And a torus has two of these kind of holes, which are really, you know, if you want to get specific, I'm it's the non-contractible loops. Right? So if, if I have these numbers, I can differentiate between these different spaces. So what does this really have to do with um, the first question is, well, what does this really have to do with data? Uh, so in principle, the way I think of data is really points as in some space. I think of it as geometric. And so, um, you know, so I can just think of these points, but 
in, pr in principle, having these points and asking for the topology of points is not really interesting, right? So because these are just points, they're a bunch of things that are not connected and any data looks like any other data because it's just some collection of points. And really the only interesting number I can figure out from this is how many data points I have. Um, so we need to introduce geometry, right? So topology isn't enough, we need actually geometry. And the key problem is, is you know, usually we think of things in terms of distances and you want things that are close by to be connected. But the, the, one of the main problems is, is that this can be ambiguous, right? So here I have this nice figure eight thing. And I, I can see that, you know, depending on how I make my choices, this thing in the middle can either be connected or not. And this will give me different, um, this will give me different answers, essentially, different topologies. Uh, and, and so one of the things and, and the kind of key tool that if you know what I'm kind of getting at, uh, so I'm going to, I'm building up towards persistent homology. And so if you know what this is, great. If not, I, I want one more kind of motivation for why one would want to do this. So number one is here we have kind of ambiguities in topology. The second one is uh, topology, you know, I, I set a sequence of numbers. These numbers are usually integers. This is something that's ultimately discrete. And, you know, here I have the fact that a torus is the same as, a filled-in torus is the same as a coffee cup, a very old and terrible topologist joke, um, because I can deform it from the donut into the coffee cup. But in principle, once we have data, this doesn't really make sense because we don't really have kind of um, ground truth space. We don't really know what the what the connections are. So kind of a much better picture is this kind of donut, right? So sec, this would be kind of a more data uh, applied topology donut where, you know, yes, it's a donut and it's filled in, but if we look closely, well, there's a lot of little holes here, right? So it really starts to depend on the scale and how we look at it, what the answer is going to be. And it's not that we say that one answer is correct and one answer is wrong. We just say that all of these things together tell us some form a description of the shape, okay? So, so that's kind of the key difference. We're not just gonna start taking a sequence of numbers. We really wanna kind of look at things at multiple scales. So the way one does this kind of a little more formally is, well, we call this a filtration. So a filtration is just an increasing sequence of spaces. Right? So whenever you go from one space to another, it just means that you can only enlarge spaces, you can't shrink them, essentially. Um, and usually, kind of the way this is done now in persistent homology, or kind of one of the most common ways that this arises, is imagine here's my point sample and I grow balls around them, right? So I thicken my points and for different radii, you know, I get different spaces, right? So this would form a filtration because as I thicken the balls great, bigger and bigger, the union of these balls becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and I have these inclusions, okay? And, and again, here, what I'm gonna be looking for is you know, not necessarily components because those are a little uninteresting. I'm going to look for holes, right? So I have a little hole here, a little hole here. You know, I have all these little holes here. And But what the common thing is, is, well, you know, okay, this hole lasts from here to here, but this big hole lasts from here to here, right? It's, I mean, you know, the way I've drawn it is a little different. In principle, if, if someone asks, I would say these are actually the same holes. And the key difference is I'm not just going to track how many of these things there are, right? So the Betty numbers are really tracking how many of these things there were. But I'm also going to track which ones kind of survive. And, you know, I'm going to say, okay, well, the big one is going to be this big bar because it lasts from here to here. Um, and this, this bar should have been shifted over, sorry. So this bar, this bar should be from here to here. And it represents this little thing. And then these two ones are kind of, are just these two things that are just happen to be here. And maybe I have another point 
here. Okay, so the kind of point behind this is that um, I'm, I'm not going to kind of go through the definitions and things because it is a little bit heavy if you've never seen it before. But um, the point being is that if I give you this sequence of spaces, I can I can produce this description. Okay, it's not terribly difficult. It's a form of Gaussian elimination, but it's very interesting mathematically, but it's really not the point of what we want to get here. We can, for now, we're just assuming that we can actually get this. Okay, um, and, and kind of the key thing to realize is that filtrations really arise from not just one space, but a function on a space. So here, for distance, it, it, it's really the distance function from the points on Euclidean space. That's kind of an alternate way to think about it. Okay. So this thing back there was really is called the persistence barcode. It's, it's well, you know, it's kind of unique. And we can compute it um, just for various reasons. We often represent this information in the form of a di what's called persistence diagram, uh, which is very simply that you take each bar and you plot its start as the x-axis and its end point as the y-axis, right? So this bar maps to here, this bar maps to here, and then these ones will just map to the diagonal here, okay? And the key insight is that the further away you are from the diagonal, the longer the bar is, okay? So th this is really just kind of an equivalent description, and, and that's all we're doing here, okay? So we're really going to concentrate on how to apply, uh, not just how to apply persistent homology, but kind of going forward, you know, this is the way the pipeline really works. You have some data, you build a model, and then you get your topological descriptor out, right? So depending on how I build my space, like my complex, so, you know, how, do I use the distance function? Do I do some density estimation? Do I do some other things, right? So depending on what I, how I impose connectivity on my space, I get this model. And then once I have that, I can compute my a topological descriptor, which is going to be through this persistent homology. So this, this is kind of a typical pipeline. Um, what this talk is really about is how we can, let's say we know something about what we expect, um, how can we use that to drive our choice of function, okay? And uh, when I say, you know, this is essentially we're going to optimize our function based on what we expect of the topological descriptor, okay? So um, kind of at the heart of this is trying to make sense of the following idea. Uh, let's say that I have my persistence diagram, so I have some points there, right? Um, and you know, I don't like the diagram I've gotten, and I say, well, I want to move this point here, this point here, this point here, this point, you know. Basically, I, I don't like the way my diagram looks, and I want it to look a certain way. And the next kind of five slides or so are basically going to be about how we can do this. So I always like to say that how this actually started. Um, I was visiting a, a, a colleague, Max Osanyakov, who's at Ecole Polytechnique, and uh, he asked me, well, you know, I really want to take the, how do you compute the derivative with respect to a persistence diagram. And me, being the good mathematician, obviously answered, well, you can't. Um, and then he proceeded to explain to me why I was wrong and, and kind of won me over. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to kind of illustrate this idea with something that's kind of very common in machine learning today and essentially start off with just explaining max pooling and how that actually solves our problem as well, okay? And well, not exactly, but but a close approximation of it. So let's say that I give you some parameterized function, right? So f alpha is x is some real valued function, right? So here's my function. So I fix alpha, I get some function, okay? And now I take the maximum of it. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to take the derivative of this maximum with respect to alpha, right? So this is kind of the continuous version of max pooling. Um, well, what do, what do we do? Well, even though this doesn't necessarily exist, 
the general trick that we do, right, or rather that a lot of the neural network stuff and deep network stuff is built on is, well, I'm going to pretend that there is a chain rule and or wave my hands around and say that generically it exists. And essentially, uh, in some local neighborhood, claim the following um, so that the derivative of the maximum is just going to be the derivative of how the function moves at the maximum you know, in, in some neighborhood, right? So as I change alpha, how does this point, how does the function value at this point change with alpha? And I'm just going to say that that's my derivative. Um, there's been a lot of work since then. One can actually make this a little more rigorous. Uh, it's obviously not defined everywhere, but people have proven all sorts of nice things that this is not as mathematically horrible as it would seem first. Okay, so what does this actually have to do with diagrams? Well, it actually ends up being kind of the same thing via this theory called Morse theory. So Morse theory is in some sense a branch of topology, uh, and it really connects geometry and topology. And kind of the key point of it that we're going to use is that in nice enough settings, critical points in the sense of critical points of functions uh, that you know that would be in calculus uh, really correspond to topological changes. Okay, so kind of maxima, saddles, right? These are the points where you have topological changes. And, and the way to think about this is that here, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be taking super, let's say, super level sets, right? So I, I cut off everything that's above, right? And whenever I hit a maximum, I end up my space gets a new component. Whenever I hit a saddle, two things merge, right? So if I look up here, I'll have a little bit of a component. I'll have a component here and a component here. And then once I pass this, these two merge. Um, and what Morse theory tells us is that between these, you, you don't actually have, the only time it's an if and only if. So uh, topological changes can only happen at critical points. So if you have the critical points in some sense, you know all about the topology. And again, kind of not generally, but in nice enough cases, one can think of persistence diagrams precisely as pairs of critical points. OK, so here, just because I'm going from the top down, I drew birth on the y-axis and death on the, on the x-axis. But you know, this point, essentially, what it's going on is, well, I have this component that's born that first appears here, and it merges with an older component here. Right? So essentially, these, you know, the, this is the um, this is the y and this is the x. And so these two critical points really generate this point. Um, I, I didn't really kind of say it because I don't want to kind of go into these details. Uh, but in, in general, the, the rule of thumb is, especially in, with components, this is the easiest way to see it. Uh, there's this thing called the elder rule that says if, if you have a choice of two things that you're going to kill, uh, you know, that, that because I don't know why we call it birth and death, but you know, so you have to kill one of these things. You, you always kill the younger one. Um, so that's that's just kind of the thing. So you, here, right, this has existed for longer, and so you you actually you end up killing this one. But kind of okay. If that didn't make sense, uh, you know, we, I will certainly answer questions about it. But the key point here is is that we really get this map from this point to x2 and x3, OK? That's, that's really the thing. So now we can do exactly the same thing as we did for max for the max pooling, right? So I have a point. I want to, you know, it's, there's two points, alpha and beta. And I want to drive the point here. Well, these two points live in my space. And so I, I just need to. I can compute the derivative of how this point moves with respect to my input parameters. Right? I mean, so if I want to drive it somewhere, I just need the functional to drive whatever my function, you know, how my function has to change in order for my points to move in that particular direction. So, you know, um, 
in principle, and so, okay, then I just compute the derivatives at the points, and I can do this, right? So uh, it's really a very minor kind of, let's say, generalization. Uh, but it turns out that, you know, a lot of things can be described in terms of these persistence diagrams, as we'll see. So now, kind of at a more kind of higher level, rather, uh, let's say that I want, how, how does my actual pipeline look? Well, you know, I have some parameter space. Um, given my parameter, I build my model. Uh, this consists of a space, which is represented here by a K, and some function, and then I compute persistence, which gives me a diagram, and I put some sort of functional, some sort of loss function on my uh, on my um, diagram, and I get some real value, and then I optimize this, right? I either want to, usually it's a loss function, so I want to minimize it. So I just now try to minimize it, and I don't really run gradient descent, but I can think of running gradient descent, where basically each of these maps in some sense, invertible via this kind of pretend chain rule. Okay, so I get kind of a map. Basically, I end up with a gradient with respect to the parameter, right? The the how the loss behaves with respect to the parameter, given through this kind of more complicated bit. Okay, uh, hopefully that's you know, the the key idea here is just the generalization from from this kind of max pooling chain rule idea to this thing where now, if I have my description, I can do the same thing by kind of going back to multiple points. And you know, th there are a lot of details there I've glossed over. Um, they are rather technical and, and interesting, and they're not terribly complicated, but kind of the takeaways that you can make this work. Okay. so. I really I'm going to concentrate on the first three bits because that's you know, in the interest of time. Um, there's been a lot of work on this in the last few years. A lot of people have tried different things. Um, I'm going to concentrate on surface reconstruction, uh, how you can better match shapes with this, and kind of more recent work, which is uh, finding how one can find recurrent behavior in time series using this which is kind of ongoing work with uh, my PhD student. Okay, but starting, let's start with something kind of a little more concrete, which is surface reconstruction. So this is a very, very classical thing in, um, in geometry processing and graphics where people scan all sorts of shapes, right? And um, they want to basically reconstruct the actual surface. Uh, and you know, the, this problem goes back 30 years, um, and people have done all sorts of things. A lot of the state of the art has to do with the fact that you build some, it, it's in some sense very similar, that it builds some function, and then it takes the zero set of that function. So you mark all points that you've, de that you've decided are outside as plus one, all points that are inside as minus one, you do some relaxation so that you get a smooth function. Then you take the zero set of this, and that's your surface, and it gives beautiful results. Uh, kind of similar to this is, uh, you know, maybe you don't do kind of plus one, minus one, but you do some sort of generalized distance function, and then you start to look at super level sets of this, right? So this is kind of a part of a figure eight, and you would say, okay, well, this this is really my surface, right? The light blue part is something that's close to my surface. Um, this is actually closer to what we're going to do, uh, but it, here's kind of the point. In both of these cases, you don't really have any control over the topology. Um, for this, for the Poisson, for the zero level set, pretty much the only thing you can say is that you get a watertight surface. Uh, but that really depends on the fact that you're dealing, doing things in co-dimension one, right? So if I wanted to reconstruct, you know, let's say a curve in three-dimensional uh, three space or let's say uh, a shape that's in four-dimensional space because it's moving, um, this absolutely couldn't work, okay? 
Uh, so, so it really, you know, it really depends on the fact that uh, on this kind of implicit functions that you build, that the zero set gives you something like a surface, and that you hope that you can filter out things that that are kind of extraneous. Um, so the question that we asked, and kind of how this got started, is well, in a lot of cases, I mean, shapes we know about what kind of topology we expect, right? Um, in, in I, you know, if we kind of divorce the fact of um, figuring out what the right topology is and just assume that we know it, right, that you have some oracle or you have a, the user that tells you, I want this kind of shape, right, can we do it, can we incorporate that using topology into our surface reconstruction problem, right? So here, I, I could choose this one or I could choose this one. But can I tell my program, if I want one, can the program return the thing that has the right topology? Right. Okay, so for this, well, how do we first need to just look at how we're going to approximate a surface? And so we have uh, some points on near the surface usually. And as I said, as I had the thing before, well, the standard topological approach is just to roll balls around it. Um, this is never really a good idea because, except for proving theorems, uh, because, well, even here, right, there's probably, you know, I've chosen the radius a little too big here, but you, you can construct examples where, um, you know, you maybe have sparsely sampled regions, and so it would make sense to use larger radii and kind of denser regions where it makes sense to use smaller radii. So uniform radii don't really make sense. Uh, and we'd want something that's closer to this, right? So sparsely sampled should be kind of bigger radii, more densely sampled, smaller radii. But uh, it's, it's not just a matter of kind of sampling. It's not just a sampling issue. It, it's something a little deeper, right? Because we also want to ensure this global constraint, right? That here that I actually cover the, the entire curve, okay? And so we don't really even use kind of balls, but what we use is Gaussians, right? So you can think about, we're gonna put a Gaussian over each point, and then we're going to change our, well, either our amplitude or, and more importantly, the, um, we're gonna change the, the, the variance, right? So the variance is gonna kind of play the, the role of, um, to play the role of radii. And we're going to do this so that the super level set of the function we get by summing up all of these Gaussians um, gives us something that essentially covers the curve. Okay, so, so that's really the idea, right? So our input is this set of points and a particular topology we'd like. And then we're going to optimize the CP and the variances so that the super level sets have the persistent uh, the, the the topology that we want so how, do, how does this actually translate into persistence well we have a space and a function so clearly the the, the natural choice is to use persistent homology to describe the entire surface but um e essentially you know since we have components holes and voids we have three diagrams right one in dimension zero one in dimension one so one in dimension two. So if, if for the curve example, we would just have zero and one. Um, but we take a look at the persistent diagram and we can say, okay, <clears throat> we implicitly say that things near the diagonal are not, are just noise. And so we, you know, if I just want one component or one hole or one void, I make sure that the most, the thing that's furthest away from the diagonal stays away from the diagonal and everything else gets pushed towards the diagonal right so i'm tr i'm trying to kind of increase the gap between between these and to prevent kind of weird scaling things one can just think about making sure that i i will keep my most persistent thing where it is and everything else should be pushed towards the diagonal uh, if i want different numbers of holes well you know I just, I, I leave whatever number of holes I have 
alone and push everything else to the diagonal. I can also kind of maximize those in certain cases. Uh, but, you know, th th these aren't kind of the only possible cost functions. But Im implicitly, what you're doing is you're specifying numbers and you're just saying, okay, the stuff that's far away from the diagonal, I want it to be really far away from the diagonal, and everything else should be kind of pushed towards the diagonal as much as possible. Okay. And so, really, the, the, you know, there are more choices, but the key notion is just how much of each dimension in topology do I want? Um, and you run this. Okay. And so, here I will have a video that a uh, student who is now at MIT uh, made. Uh, and it's, so here's the optimization running. And it's exactly the example from before where this is the figure eight. And here we have this stuff that we want connected. Um, and so the optimization is running, right? And it's, it's a little slow at the beginning, but we'll see it's going to start to converge very soon. And that these, this one's going, oh, I like this one stop. Um, so this did not run, I like this thing run. Um, but you can see this one should, I, why is it not running? Oh, it's for some reason it's not running, which I have no idea why. But this one should um, should kind of get further away, and this one actually gets connected. Um, I'm not really sure why this isn't showing up the way it should, but we'll we'll kind of come back to it later if there's time. Um, okay, but let's say that there's now we do actually have um, that we do actually have this the right super level set, but we still need to extract the surface. Um, so, you know, imagine this is our super level set. That's not really a surface. So you want really to extract something like this. And um, in a lot of cases, there is a reasonable choice for this. And this is the when we actually compute persistence, uh, we do get kind of something that represents each hole. And so we can use that. Um, we don't have any guarantees that this is the right thing. But in, in practice, it's, it's very rare to come across examples where it really messes up. But just kind of using that bit is not going to necessarily be geometrically very nice. So then one would want to do some kind of local geometric optimization where you know, if there's some little notch like this, you kind of straighten it out. And again, there, there's kind of some very basic and very kind of natural way in, in which one can do this. Okay, so <clears throat> kind of moving on to more examples. Uh, here we have a steering wheel. And essentially, all of our examples are relatively low resolution. We don't really require a lot of points. Uh, but that also means that the extracted surface doesn't look particularly nice. Uh, but here it's a steering wheel, so it's the same three points. Um, and you know you can either require one hole, two holes, or three holes, and essentially this is what pops out. So in this case, I believe the steering wheel is actually filled in. Okay, but you can see that essentially, you know, just by choosing the number, you actually get the right number of things. Um, I will say that you know a, a good question would be, well, why was this hole chosen and not this hole? Um, that kind of thing we can't control uh, and is kind of a good question for further work, um, how one kind of can localize these changes. Um, it's a bit of a tricky question, and but you know it, it's something that I, I think can be done, but it's still being worked on. Uh, kind of another example is here I have the spider and an ant, I think. Uh, and, and in principle, the key difference is, you know, is the inside here connected, or is it actually, is this, is it two separate spheres really that we see here? And it, it's the same thing up here. Um, and in principle, the only thing we've chosen is, do we want one, one big hole in here, or no, sorry, not one void in here, or do we want two voids in here? So this is kind of the higher dimensional example of what we saw before. Um, 
and, and then we have the Stanford Bunny, and this is so with Poisson construction, if you have low sampling density, then things get disconnected. Uh, and this is a heart, and he's, again, Poisson kind of fills it in, whereas we can keep the, the actual, um, what is it, the, the, the veins and the arteries kind of open here, right? Okay, so, so you know, surface reconstruction, this was um, published this year, actually. Um, but it, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of a natural application. Um, the next application I kind of want to go through a little faster is, is, is a little more abstract. Um, and it has to do with kind of finding matchings between shapes. So this is in general a hard problem for a number of reasons. It's if one tackles it combinatorially, it's tricky. Um, there are symmetries. So it's very hard to kind of decide locally on what a good match is most of the time. Um, and actually, the, my colleague, Max um, at Polytechnique, he, one of the things that he's done is he doesn't just look at the shapes as kind of points, but what he studies as well is kind of the Laplace Beltrami operator on them or other operators on them. Um, and essentially, you know, if again, if you know what this is, great. If not, it's not particularly important. But it's, it's the simple way to think about it is it's Fourier analysis on shapes. And it's a way to give you eigenfunctions uh, on a shape. And if your function is nice enough, you can represent it in terms of these eigenfunctions and in terms of certain coefficients. OK? So in principle, the key insight that he had, and he's done a lot of work, very nice work on this, is that rather than try to map points to points, he tries to find functionals which map functions to functions. And it turns out this is a vastly easier problem, right? Because once we lift things to the space of functions, almost everything becomes linear. Uh, you know, you can do all sorts of nice optimization on it, and it works amazingly well, OK? And kind of the key problem, you know, so, so the key problem, it becomes almost completely linear because you're just trying to find, you know, if you have, um, if you figure out kind of how to map eigenfunctions to eigenfunctions, then just by linearity, you can figure out, you can map any function to any function. Okay, and once you have that, you know, they send delta functions through and in principle see where they end up and that gives them their correspondence. Um, there is one problem though, once you raise to, to uh, kind of this functional world, um, there's no natural way to enforce continuity in the point-to-point -point maps, right? The functional, the, the space of map, you know, you're mapping all functions to all functions, which also include non-continuous functions. You know, you, you might map things non-continuously, right? Uh, so th this was really where the interest of the two things kind of coincided. And, and the key point is there's this theorem that's, I think, from the 60s. It basically says that you know, a continuous map, essentially, all it does is a different characterization of it is if it maps super level sets to super level sets, you know, super level sets don't change topology, then it, it's, it is actually a continuous map. Okay. And so what we want to do is, you know, maybe the functional that we found maps this F to something like this. And, you know, here we have to choose in some sense between these. And that's not a very continuous map, but what we want is something unimodal. And so we want to map something like this to something like this. And, and this is exactly kind of the same optimization problem that we just saw, right? So our input is a finite set of basis functions and some target persistence diagram, right? So if it's unimodal, we just want one thing in zero dimensions and everything else should be close to the diagonal. And then what we're going to do is we're going to try to find the coefficients of these eigenfunctions so that our diagram looks like the diagram that we want. And there are plenty of distances that we can define on the diagram that aren't, you know, it's not particularly important what they are, but they exist and 
we can plug it in as a loss function, right? So we're minimizing the distance between two diagrams. And again, we throw it into this machinery and it, it pops out, right? Uh, so, you know, just kind of some examples. Here we have the, um, you know, function one, function two, and we're optimizing really function two. And, you know, here you can see the two points, the two diagrams don't really match up. And here they match up perfectly, right? So we start off at F2, and then we optimize it so that it looks like F1. And the key bit here is that we're really just changing the coefficients of the eigenfunction. So we're really working in the spectral domain. And that's really the surprising part about why this, that this should even work. Um, you know, kind of a different way of thinking about uh, of line, you know, functions alignment is simplification. So you can think about, you know, multiple maxima here, right? So I have uh, hands and feet, uh, and then just I want one maxima, and so I just get one of the hands, right? So it, it was a very big surprise that this actually worked. Um, you know, it's, it's well defined, but I, I was really surprised when, when I saw these things and saw how well they worked. Um, kind of two more very quick results, right, is one can also use the same idea to denoise these shape correspondences, which was the original kind of goal. And again, the whole bit is really translating this into a target persistence diagram that we'd like, and then op using that to incorporating that into our kind of whole optimization scheme. Uh, and again, you can then also, you know, kind of similarly improve functional maps about this. And, you know, one can kind of look at this and see that it's much, much cleaner. You know, for this bit, it's much cleaner here than it is here. And essentially, that was just taken care of by the optimization. Okay. So in, in the last five minutes, um, I wanted to kind of get to what my current student is doing. Um, and that's kind of finding recurrent patterns. And it's, it's a very similar idea, but it, it, it's, it's something that I think is, is really kind of nice and, and I do want to kind of just mention it. So um, in the study of periodic functions, we ultimately just really have Fourier analysis, right? So, I mean, we've just seen we have eigenfunctions and we, you know, if the eigenfunctions are periodic, if it's sine and cosine, well, I'm done, right? But if it's not periodic, if it's only recurrent, um, one needs to do all sorts of things in Fourier analysis, and it's not, it doesn't always work particularly well. Uh, so here's kind of an alternate view of what we're really looking for. Uh, let's say a more topological view, right? And so if I do sign, you know, one can think of it as really just going in a circle at a constant speed, right? I mean, this is the classical thing where sine is the projection onto y-axis as you go around the cir unit circle at constant spin, right? So, okay, so we see that, you know, the circle is something we can detect, something we know, something topological, um, and we want to use this, right? So it turns out, well, this isn't a particular idea. In the 80s, there was a theorem given by Ta Florin Hawkins. Uh, so I'm not going to go through the entire thing. It's not particularly important. Uh, so what he cared about was chaotic systems. And what this theorem ultimately says is that, let's say I have some chaotic system on some high dimensional manifold that's, you know, again, these are mathematical theorems. So there's always kind of this caveat of nice enough. And then I project this down in some non-degenerate way, and I get a time series, right? So I have some dynamics running on some manifold, and then I project it down, and so I get this time series, right? For each point, I get some real-valued function, and I get a time series. And essentially, what he showed was that if then one lifts this time series up to a high enough dimension, not only recover the manifold itself, but also the dynamics. So in, in principle, the fact if you observe something for long enough, you haven't really lost any information about the dynamics. And that's, I think, very, very surprising. So 
kind of at the heart of this is this Takin's embedding. And here I have my approximation of you know, some time series that goes on forever. And the idea is very simple, right? So at a time t, I pick two delays, right? So t of delta 1, t plus delta 2. And I just take this and I plot it into three-dimensional space, right? So this point be, I take as the coordinates of these three points, right? So essentially, I get this embedding into R3. And I do this for all points. And this gives me a curve, right? So kind of here's a nice video of how, and this one does work, so that's good, um, right? How this works. So I have two signs. And if I have, you know, these are the two delays. So I get the curve that, well, I get an ellipse. And then obviously, as I shift this to something like by halves, right, I will get kind of the perfect circle. And then as I move it back, it kind of goes back to something that looks like an ellipse. Uh, and if they are exactly out of phase, then I'll, I'll just get a line. OK? Um, so I don't know why that's twice. Um, so kind of, OK, well, that's circles and signs. So I haven't, we already have Fourier analysis for this. Um, but the key point is, there's kind of more general things. So you know, for sine, it is just a circle. If I have multiple frequencies, you know, it's going to wrap around a torus and fill in a torus. But circles also describe this kind of more general behavior, like a Lorentz attractor. I can think about kind of going here and back and here and back and here and back, right? And it's kind of like two circles glued together. And if I start to think about it, I, I can think that pretty much almost any recurrence I can think of is, you know, starting somewhere, going off somewhere, and then coming back. And at least topologically, that's going to look like a circle. Um, so again, now we're just really looking for circles, right? And so what's that going to look like when we do our optimization? Well, I'm looking, I'm going to maximize one component and one whole and just minimize all the rest, right? And that's really the core idea of kind of finding recurrent circles, because um, even though Tawkins proved this theorem, it turns out that getting the embedding right, especially in higher dimensions, is really tricky because the geometry changes a lot as I change my parameter, uh, you know, if it's not just the sign, if it's something more complicated. And so I, I, need, um, I need to do something a little fancier, right? So I, I want to kind of find a good embedding. And, and this is really kind of one of the first ways in which to kind of do this based on the data. Um, OK, so one kind of bit I'm not really going to go over because I'm a little over time is uh, we don't really just take different points. But again, we convolve with some Gaussian because it has some nice properties. Um, and kind of another point is that once you actually find the circle, there does this way to actually get angles out of it, OK? So you can do actual reconstruction. And this is kind of based on some work that was now quite a few years ago. But in, in principle, it, it, it's, again, dependent on some uh, rather standard topological fact. But the point being that for circles, and specifically for circles, I, this absolutely does not generalize. Um, you can get, you can recover kind of all, you, you can recover the unique, in some sense, uh, angle valued map that, that, that describes this circle. Because each, you know, each circle is, even if it's not really a geometric circle, is kind of characterized by an angle, right, from 0 to 2 pi, where it goes and kind of wraps around. OK, and, and you know, we, we tried various things. And on simple things, it works. If you add some noise, it still gives you the right thing. And you know, the, the delay is very close to what it should be. Um, you know, even if it's something kind of nonlinear, it still kind of converges to the right bit. And obviously, though, there, there are fail cases that if you start off with something that's bad, you're just going to kind of converge to garbage. Okay? But, but in some sense, from the diagram, we can see that it's garbage. OK, so, so you know, this is still kind of work in progress. We're still kind of trying to see how far we can push this, um, you know, whether certain iterative schemes are better or you know, other kinds of choices. Uh, so we're still kind of working on this. But I, I think it's very exciting because we 
you'll get to kind of find recurrent behaviors without really depending on um, on kind of having a good set of basis functions. It's 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 really a kind of topological Fourier analysis. Uh, so just a few more pictures. Um, you know, the students have also found ways to incorporate this <clears throat> to generate cleaner digits, right? So thicker that are kind of more topologically secure. Um, and another kind of really cool one, and this is the last one, is um, if one plays around with different cost functions, you can get all sorts of funky patterns. Like you know, if you just want to minimize the zero dimensional persistence, you get a tree. If you maximize the one dimensional persistence, the biggest one, you get a circle. If you do something in between, this kind of flower pattern. Um, it's, I, I don't really have a good application for this. I just think it's really cool. Um, and with that, you know, I'll, I'll kind of finish. And sorry for going on. Um, I see that there's, um, well, okay, no, so there's no message. Um, yeah, kind of, you know, I, I've kind of given you a lot of information, and it ended up being more than I actually planned. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of details that I've hidden, but the key bits are that really we can enforce these qualitative constraints. Uh, topology gives a natural language to express them. And I think it's exciting that we can actually now take these qualitative constraints and in some relatively straightforward way, incorporate them into some sort of continuous optimization. Um, and you know, I, I, there are many other ap applications that are out there. People are use, looking at topological regularizers for, um, for neural networks. Um, you know, there's a bunch of other kinds of things that people are trying to do. Uh, and, and I want to kind of emphasize this as well, that um, you know, persistent homology is by far the most, one of the more well-developed topologic, applied topological tools, but there are other tools there. And um, I think in the next kind of few years, we're going to see how we can incorporate more and more into this, into these kinds of existing machine learning um, kind of frameworks, not in a sense to try to beat them because I think that's kind of a silly thing to do, but, but I think they have different strengths and combining them will really kind of emphasize, will we'll give some kind of, will give exciting results. Uh, and with that, I, I do apologize for all the technical problems. Um, and that the very nice video for some reason when it worked yesterday it didn't work today. Um, but um, I hope you know you enjoyed the talk and certainly if you have any questions, um, I'll be happy to answer anything. Thanks. Okay. Um, Someone's still here. <laughs> yeah, we're here. Rick has a question. <laughs> uh, hi, Primo. So hi. great talk. Um, I had a question about this last bit about the periodicity thing. Yes. So uh, th there's a problem related to this that we had considered a while ago, but we didn't look at the topological angle and maybe mm -hmm. your thing helps there. So the problem is that uh, suppose you have this sort of a periodic behavior, but mm -hmm. there is noise in the parameters. So for example, your periodicity or your phase is mm -hmm. a bit noisy it can change so yeah. the very good example is something like heartbeat which mm -hmm. is that your heart can beat a little faster for some reason when you run or something mm -hmm. and then it goes back so there is an inherent periodicity but yes. that periodicity changes a little bit and the phase mm -hmm. also changes a little bit right. and these sorts of things are not caught very well by fourier transform because once right. your phase has changed it is going to kill the dominant frequency right Absolutely, i'm yeah. just wondering if uh, Right. things can help. Uh, it's, you know, we're still getting it to the point. So um, as with a lot of these things, one needs, you know, the, the, the devil is a little bit in the details. And uh, uh, right now it's it's just being, the, the, my student is just setting it up so that it's a little more robust so that we can try. I mean, essentially we're at the point of trying it on real data. Uh, mm -hmm. What I suspect is, the, there's two ways one could do this. Um, in, in principle, I think, yes, it should be able to do it. The question, the only question I have is 
uh, the only kind of concern that I would have is can we can the optimization you know, w is our parameter space in some sense big enough and with kind of a constant bandwidth for you know different delays can we mm -hmm. capture all of these different things right so if actually you know what you you start to put a not just the different delays but also let's say different bandwidths at different points and just require some sort of smoothness um right. I mean, conceptually, this is exactly the right tool because, you know, even for phase shifts, um, let, let's say I have phase shifts or something else like this, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, different speeds, essentially, I'm always going around the same space, okay. just at slightly different speeds, right? Yeah. And yeah. so if my optimization can, can, in some sense, automatically, if, if the optimization has a parameter space that's big enough, Right. It should be able to compensate for this. Right. And so we should be able to capture it. Right. Uh, but I, I don't want to claim that, you know, here here's a here's a library that will solve your problems. We're not we're not there yet. No, of course. Uh, uh, in fact, if it solves too easily, then it's perhaps not an interesting question <laughs> anymore. <laughs> so we um, can discuss later how to make it interesting. Exactly. I, I mean Kind of related to this, uh, so Michael Robinson at American University has done quite a bit of work, and he has this book on topological signal processing. And there, he kind of flips things around, and he says, "Well, if I know that what I'm really looking for on a, is a circle, and I know my heartbeat is really, you know, kind of this, I, I can just try to locally fit things directly onto there, right? And, and maybe, you know, and, and then I, I, I." I if I know from first principles that my model should be this way, then I, I maybe don't need to do the optimization. But, um, you know, it, especially given the way things work these days where people throw you know, the kitchen sink into into all sorts of machine learning algorithms, it, it, it seems like something comes out. <laughs> if, if we can help that, you know, if, if we can help that along, it, it, yeah. it's generally good for, for everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? So uh, I have a quick one. Um, maybe that will follow up to Rex. Um, if, if I look at my problem, what kind of properties of it indicate that topological methods That's are going to be applicable here? Um, so th there's a few, you know, I, I will say there's a few um, general things that I, you know, kind of indicators I look for. I, I, I wouldn't want to claim any kind of completeness and um, generality in this. But so, so the, the examples, the things that these examples have in common is um, that the input that you want to give it is in some sense um, kind of global, number one, global, and number two, descriptive in the sense of, you know, exactly like components, holes, right? It's determined by kind of what I would call a rough shape, right? Um, so, you know, recurrence is via circles, um, you know, the continuous maps bits are uh, given by this kind of really the fact that it's topology preserving, um, you know, th th these sorts of flavors are kind of clear. Uh, one thing that's not, I didn't talk about, uh, because I don't really have a good application for it yet. But another place where topology naturally appears is, is, is when you're not really just considering, let's say, one object, but you're considering maps between objects, right? So um, if one looks, topology, you know, classical topology is really, uh, and you know, not classical, but let's say, you know, Topology. Instead of applied topology, let's call it topology. Topology. Uh, a lot of it looks at kind of spaces of maps between spaces, um, and I, I will say over the last few years, applied topology has started to look at that as well. Um, like I said, uh, persistence is maybe not, you know, it, it's it's the big hammer that we have and that's really well developed. But there are a lot of other tools that we can use to kind of um, to kind of specify these things, right? So 
Um, in, in general, you know, where it is now, I would say if the problem can be described in terms of shape, um, this kind of geometric topological approach probably has something to say. Whether it's something useful is a different question. Um, or um, again, if you have kind of collections of things and maps between them, kind of the spaces of maps are also um, well-described topologically. 